Everyone, welcome or welcome back to the Dan Nessel Show. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different on the show. You know, so far we've talked a lot about marketing and about communications. We've talked about personal development. And today we'll, we will cover some of that, but the focus will be something a little bit different but related, which is sales. My guest today lives and breathes sales. He has gone through the process from being a list builder and cold caller all the way up to being the CEO and co founder of a company that specializes in deploying highly specialized sales teams for corporate clients of all sizes. Um, He is an expert in systems thinking and certainly in all manners of sales. And he's got a lot to say and he's got one heck of a journey to share. So without any further ado, let's get right into it. William Gilchrist. I am here with William Gilchrist of Consig. Uh, He's the CEO of Consig in Singapore. And I'm just thrilled to be here with him. I'll tell you why, because... um, William is like a third generation podcast guest for me. And I'm only on episode like 26, 27. It's crazy. Why, you know, the way that networking and the way that relationships work, I met Raymond McConnell and you might remember his name from an earlier episode, who is a executive coach and trainer extraordinaire for sure. And, um, you know, runs training company across Asia through him came Kyle Haggerty, the author of the accidental business nomad. And now through Kyle and through Raymond comes William and uh, William here, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody who's listening, but if you paid attention to the episode on uh, the accidental business nomad, William's story may have been in it in a way, but of course, unnamed, right? So anyway, William is here hot from Singapore and he's holding the book accidental business nomad. Kyle, I'm sure you're going to love that, but, um, I'm, I'm looking at him on the screen and here he is, Mr. William Gilchrist. William? Dan, thanks for having me. Thanks for having it me. I'm really p- excited to be here. And um, yeah, the previous podcasts were definitely uh, close to home and I'm really, really excited to be here for sure. Dude, I feel like more plugged into Singapore than I ever did when I lived in Asia because I've got <laughs> Raymond and Kyle and also Michael Netsley. I don't know if you met him, but he's, he's also part of that network. He's part of the, yeah. yeah. It's part of the crew, right? Michael said all his work on neuroscience is just, it still has my head spinning, you know, every time I think about it. And, um, you know, that's why, you know, it's, it was awesome to get in touch with you. And we've spoken now once or twice and we have just, there's a fascinating story here that I, I would love you to tell William. And I'm not going to spoil it too much, but just the journey from Chicago to university to, to be under Kyle's tutelage across Asia and how that exploded into an entrepreneurial and a tech career and back to an entrepreneurial career that is uh, really just blossoming, I think. And I want to hear people hear your story, how you got to where you are. Um, It's fairly unique, how you deal with uh, multiple cultures, dealing with, as has been a theme on some of the shows, how you deal with multiple cultures, how you have been building your business across numerous countries. There's just so much there to unpack. So I just want to start off by just handing it over to you, William, and just say, hey, man, why don't you tell us your story? Sure, sure, sure. Well, um, born and raised in Olympia Fields, Illinois, so I'm a suburban brat. Some uh, what <laughs> they like to call a fake Chicagoan. Um, but I went to uh, school uh, in the city. Uh, so a proud alumni of Hales Franciscan High School, which is um, a Catholic school, um, very um, historically African-American uh, Catholic high school in Chicago. Mm. My relationship with Asia specifically actually dates back to the age of five. Um, my mom bought the Encyclopedia uh, Britannica and um, had a big bookshelf on there and CH was one of them. And um, I opened up CH and as a kid, I was flipping through the pages and came across China. And I thought it was so incredibly different to anything that I had um, ever seen before in terms of the culture that I was raised in. And my mom is a children's book author, illustrator, and a fine artist. So we did a lot of traveling a lot as a kid into Europe and uh, into 
predominantly Europe and, and the Caribbean. And I remember on my ninth birthday, I put, I'm sorry, on, when I was nine on my Christmas list, I actually put a bunch of toys, um, some video games. And I said, look, you don't have to give me any of these if you can just give me a trip to China. So either or, nine. either you give me the toys or mm-hmm. I can get a trip to, to China. My mom thought that was adorable. She thought it was so funny. She's like, oh, one day, you know, um, we might be able to bring the China, but you're going to get the toys this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, shockingly, four years later, I was um, someone anonymously uh, referred me to the student ambassador program where I actually ended up living in China at 13. So I actually, uh, without my parents, was able to go to China and actually experience that. So my relationship with Asia actually goes back about 23 years. So this was 1997 when Hong Kong was switching mm-hmm. back over to Chinese rule. When they had that yeah. big celebration in Beijing, I was there as a 13 wow. year old. So part of that historical moment. And it's odd because that scenario is still playing out today um, politically. Yeah. And, you know, being kind of a part of the start of that and um, people talking about, you know, potentially the Olympics coming to China at that time. This is in the 90s. And this is long before the China boom or, you know, the wave in, in, in the media in terms of business. And just being in that environment was phenomenal for me. And right before I left, I remember being um, on my way to the airport and we were in some random area of Beijing. And I saw this guy, this uh, foreign guy, this American guy. He had a Mercedes Benz and he had a mobile phone. Now, in the 90s, having a yeah. mobile phone, particularly in like a place like China, was a big deal. And then he had this Mercedes and he was standing outside of his car and he was on his phone. And I looked at him as a little boy and I was like, wow. wow. And yeah, I had my little student ambassador badge. And I walked up to him and I said, hey, uh, th- sir, um, you're American like me. I'm super just. I'm a kid, right? You're yeah, American like you're, me. Like I, you have a car and you have a mobile phone and, and you're just here. Like how, how'd you do it? And he just looked at me and kind of, I mean, I, clearly this guy probably doesn't know the impact he had on my life right then, but he looked at me, he said, it's easy, man. You got on the plane already, learn the language, get on a plane again. Just that simple. Just come back. You can have all of this. This is nothing. I just put my time here. And wow. I mean, talk about, Boom, like a, just a, <laughs> like so a 13 year old boy, he changed the trajectory of how I saw China versus a visit as a kid. Like this is a once in a lifetime thing to, oh, I could do this anytime. I, I could actually make my life Asia if I wanted to. I could, I could have a reality just like this guy. And, That's amazing. Um, and how long you, you were there for that visit? About a year. That time. I, it was yeah, a whole year yeah. without your parents at age 13 and in China. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where you really base, got your base in learning the language. No, actually, I did not learn the language at all. Um, it was more experience. Um, I, wow. I hadn't thought of it at the time. I was mm-hmm. visually and just emotionally there as a tourist and, and kind of an, ex, an experience kid right at that point. I didn't yeah. really know that I could or I didn't really know that, that was a possibility. But it was that conversation as I was leaving. It was almost like the universe put that together. Just That's amazing. so incredibly like, whoa, this, this guy, he's American like me and he's here and just, it's amazing what you can do to a kid, you know? And it just changed. Mm-hmm. I, I flew back and my mom's joke was, yeah, he flew back and he was never the same again. He was a totally Well, isn't person. that the case? Yeah. I, I can't imagine what it would have been like at, at 13 or 14. I mean, I went to Japan when I was, you know, 21, just about 22, but I was still 21 at the time. And, um, it changed me forever. Absolutely. I mean, anybody who listens to this show or certainly knows me at all knows that I, I went one way, came back another. And I don't know if that's good or bad, but it is what it is. And I'm, I feel great about it. I think it was the best experience I ever had. It's interesting that you had that kind of mindset shift when you were, you know, 13 or so, because it just reminded me of the time of where I got into the Japan thing. People always ask me, why did you decide to go? And there's all kinds of reasons, but ultimately I really got the bug when I was probably around that, around that age, around 12, 13 from of all people, my rabbi. And, um, I was, my dad had just passed away and I had, um, I was studying for my bar mitzvah, (laughs) believe it or not. And, uh, my rabbi, he was a young dude at the time for a rabbi. Anyway, he was like in his thirties, really cool cat. He'd been to Woodstock for crying out loud, or he'd actually, you know what he would tell me 
not to fib because he wasn't actually at Woodstock. He could have gone to Woodstock. He chose to do something different, but he loved the music of Woodstock and he introduced me to all that stuff. And, but in the process of studying, you know, he had Japanese stuff all over his house. He introduced me to the game of go. He told me about um, Miyamoto Musashi and the book of the five rings, you know, these kinds of things are really impressionable upon and a very impressionable child. And I just took that with me and it just grew from there. That was, that planted the, the seed, I think, and the kernel that eventually became this basically single-minded desire to get to Japan when I was, you know, in college and, and beyond. So my point is that it's around that time. It's that kind of early adolescence where we're super impressionable. And, you know, it seems like that's what happened to you too. But anyway, I didn't mean that. You just reminded me of that story. Please continue. I didn't mean yeah, to interrupt. Oh, it's awesome. That's yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, so I left off at, oh, so I came back. And mm-hmm. at that point, I finished out um, junior high. And then I went to high school. And then through high school, my whole focus was to get myself to a point to where I could go to a college that had a focus on international relations. Um, that mm-hmm. was my thing. I, I mean, I guess even still to this day, maybe my, my dream in life is to eventually be an ambassador or a foreign minister yeah. or something like that. It's been my dream mm-hmm. since I was really young. And um, my mom, um, being this huge supporter of travel, huge supporter of, of just being global, she knows she has an American kid, but she's like, you need to understand Earth more than just Chicago or mm-hmm. more than just America. So since I had all this international exposure already, Um, She was on the hunt. And oddly enough, sometimes things come full circle. Mm -hmm. A really close family friend had a son who graduated from Bowdoin College, which also Kyle's alma mater. And uh, literally when I came out of the womb, we mean literally like in the hospital, when I came out of the womb, that family friend said, hey, you know, that baby should go to Bowdoin. (laughs) <laughs> and my mom was like holding me like what really like, that, was, that was like the weirdest conversation to have. that was the weirdest thing lo and behold <laughs> 18 years later here i am applying to Bowdoin. i applied to a few other schools georgetown uh got into georgetown i, I applied to uh, cornell which is actually a later story and um i ended up visiting Bowdoin and I, I had friends who were a little bit older than me, and so I saw their, their freshman college experiences. And when I visited Bowdoin, I saw their international relations program. I saw their mm-hmm. mascot, which is the polar bears, which was awesome. I was like, that's yeah. unique. I definitely would love to be a polar bear. And then I also saw their dorm size <laughs> and just how they were just – the whole I have a Bowdoin shirt on right now. Um, yeah. how, how they were totally set up. And I said, you know what? This will be a good place for me. And when I uh, went there, I majored in international relations and I minored in Chinese politics. And oh. I thought, okay, well, look, this is going to be my, my focus. And it, it's a really strong international relations program. So I studied, went through you know, everything, all four years, did everything that college kids do. Um, it's amazing. And then upon graduation, it was another kind of a watershed moment where I said, okay, well, all my friends were going into banks. They were going to Lehman Brothers and things like that. Well, you know how that turned out. They were all going to be mm-hmm. bankers, all my close friends. Uh, we're moving to New York. We're going to be bankers. And I said, eh, you know what? I, I think I'm going to teach uh, English in public school in China. And everybody's like, what? Woo! Yeah, this is, this is it. I've, I've just spent four years now writing papers on theory and hypothetical uh, political issues. And you know what? I haven't actually experienced China as an adult, like literally living as an adult, like existing in my own apartment and taking in public transportation and just really living in that world. I've written about it. I've read about it. I've done that extent study about it. And I could speak as a scholar, but I haven't actually lived and breathed it. Mm-hmm. So upon graduation, um, there, were, there was an interesting conversation where at Bowdoin, they say you don't pay for Bowdoin for the school. You pay for Bowdoin for the alumni. Of course. And I'll explain why that actually became very apparent um, later on um, in that when I went to teach English in Shanghai, um, I was in a public school system. The head of City Weekend magazine in Shanghai was a Bowdoin alum. So Mm -hmm. I had coffee with her immediately. As soon as I landed, I had someone to have coffee with. A really um, 
big um, Bowden alumna uh, who's also heavy in the tech scene, William Balbean. He was in China. He was somebody who I was talking to. I mean, I just had all these people who, as soon as I landed, I just I had people yeah. bounce ideas off of, but you didn't feel alone. And I was like, wow, this Bowden degree, really, this is uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I did that uh, for about a year. And then I started working in media relations in the corporate sector sure. in Shanghai. And I was doing a presentation and I watched this guy, also an American guy, do a presentation in Chinese. And my presentation was probably much better than his, but he did his in <laughs> Chinese and he won the room so quick. And I, it felt like the force in Star Wars. I said, ooh, if I could just have the power to do that. Mm -hmm. So I actually ended up uh, quitting that job and going to Cornell University. So I flew back to the States. Went to mm -hmm. Cornell University to study Chinese, and then they flew me back to China to finish out my degree in Beijing University. Wow. So um, that was through the Falcon program at Cornell. Was that an actual grad program, or was it yes. an undergrad? Is it like a, it's a grad program, a, yeah. Wow. So how long, that, how long were you at Cornell studying? So we were at Cornell for over a year, but mm -hmm. you have to test into it. So I'd already lived in China. Yeah. at that time. So I had a very street working understanding of Chinese. So you kind of mm -hmm. have to go through like a test to get into it and then they yeah. accelerate you. Um, but once you get to Beijing University, they treat you like you are just a student who's probably yeah. a native level and they are, you know, so you already have to have a level and they just, they take you to like a really, really, really extreme level. And it's a fun, I actually, I still have, I keep my, my textbook. Uh, still just, just to remember, yep. you know, like just, I always look at it and just remind myself I'm a student, but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So graduated from there and I thought everything was great. I'm going to go into the state department. I'm going to get a really high end job. And it was 2008. The economy was tanking. We had a recession and the Olympics was coming. Oh so, yeah, that's right. So those two things meant you kind of get your diploma and you kind of got to go. Uh, really not much oh yeah. Going they, on. Yeah. They kicked you out. Just, well, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like an official <laughs> kick out. It was more like, D what are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> there's nothing really here. Um, so I ended up moving back to Chicago and I was like, okay, I got to get back to Asia. And lo and behold, my old high school, the chairman of the board found out that I was in, in back home and he said, look, you have an amazing, at 25, you have an amazing story. I want you to be director of admissions and college planning of this high school. So I got this amazing package coming back, super spoiled, uh, amazing package coming back. And this director kind of role in, in my old high school where I was now selling an all male Catholic education that costs money to kids where there's a free co-ed option right next door. Uh, yeah, difficult. I'm sure that was a that was an easy sell. You got to sell grandmothers and grandfathers. That's the way to do it. You got to sell tradition. <laughs> you got to sell, sell those so things. So that was my first so sales role. I was going to say, this must have been your first real foray into sales and, and um, what a, like almost trial by fire in some ways that was. That's not an easy yeah. one to do. Yeah. And I didn't realize that it was sales yet. In fact, my whole thing yeah. was still State Department and global. And, and actually, this will tie in very well mm -hmm. to some of your previous guests on this podcast. Okay. I actually broke yep. the sure. admissions uh, record in school and I was offered to be um, vice principal of the school. And I didn't, you know, 25, 26, they're like, you're doing amazing. You're a good face for it. And I said, you know, I think I want to go back to Asia. So I tapped into the Bowdoin Alumni Network and mm -hmm. I interviewed with a gentleman by the name of Kyle Hegarty. And Kyle was hilarious. Kyle said, okay, wait, so you speak Chinese. So you actually speak it, you know, Kyle's so direct. You, yeah. so you actually speak this stuff, right? You do, right? And I'm like, I believe yeah. so. I mean, I'm still working on English, man. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, fluency is a gradient. He said, okay. So he put me on the phone with a Chinese speaker, tested it, and I can hear him in the background. Does, does it check out? Does it check out? <laughs> and then she goes, yeah, actually it does. And he goes, okay, great. So um, you're going to be my intern fly to Singapore. I'd never been to Singapore before. I'm flying mm -hmm. to Singapore and um, you're going to work for me. And then we're going to go from there. And he's like, look, you're ready for a ride. This is what it is. This is what I have to offer. I'm building this 
branch out here in, in Asia. You want to get back to Asia, this is the way to do it. So I jumped into a, from a high paying director's role to a unpaid internship. In, in Singapore. Yeah. With Kyle Hegarty. Pack my bags, pack my bags. <laughs> and this is where it gets extra funny, where I land in Singapore. Kyle gives me a stack of cards and tells me to do data entry. And he says, yeah, we have drinks tonight over at, uh, at the American Club. I want you to meet some people. Okay. So I do the data entry. I put a suit on. I don't know why I did this. I put a suit on. Like, I don't know. I don't know what. I'm going to turn right? I don't, I don't well, know what's going on. What do you know? I'm, I'm 26. I'm just trying to figure things out. And I walk into the American Club and there sits Raymond McConnell. All right. And one of the a cast first, of characters that I know. Yeah, I like this story. Yeah. 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 And, one, and, and, and I'll never forget this. One of the first things he said to me, he goes, so what are you trying to do? Like, what is the point of you being out here? Why are you intern?" I said, oh, I think I might go into the State Department and I want to work. He goes, nah, nah, I'm not going to do that. You're going to be a salesman. You're going to be a salesman. I said, what? Uh, what do, no, I don't, nah, you'll, you'll be a salesman. It's fine. Um, so what, what you're going to do is you're going to train it's under fine. me. You're going to train under me and um, you're going to also train under Kyle as well. I'm going to put you through <laughs> our, our program and yeah, no, you're going to be a salesman. And he kept pumping me up. No, you're going to be like one of the best salesmen I've ever seen. Honestly, I can already tell. This is your personality. You're going to be, and I was like, what, what have I entered into? Like, this yeah. is like an interesting I, little circle of people, you know? So that's how I got to Singapore and, and, yeah. and, and all of that. And that's how actually I got to know your, your previous guests on this podcast. Yeah. And it's a great story. And it's also, you know, it sort of shows your determination in what you can do. And you're just, when you make a decision, it means you kill all your other choices. I've heard that before. I know that that's probably Tony Robbins has said that, but um, I know that um, an influence of mine, a gentleman named Cliff Ravenscraft said that to me a couple, you know, about six or eight months ago, and it changed my life um, in a number of ways. But that's what you did, right? I mean, you made these decisions and um, nothing was going to dissuade you from doing that. And I think that was the, that must've been the force of nature that Raymond and and Kyle saw. I can imagine that that's probably how they described you. <laughs> um, I, was but, there. Um, I was there to be yeah. abroad for sure. <laughs> well, you ended up, so you ended up, you know, joining with Kyle and in Kyle's book, Kyle talks about these characters. And he said that they're sort of, each character is sort of an amalgam of different people. But generally speaking, there's, there's this one guy who is, uh, goes around and builds basically a database of contacts. Um, that was, I think, you know, my understanding is basically that's, that's the easiest way to describe what the company is doing was outbound sales and building lists for right. outbound sales. Right? Right, right. And, um, to build that list takes a lot of resourcefulness, I think is the right word. And that's, uh, and there's a character in the book that travels all around Asia, basically, um, with a lot of free reign to go and build these lists. And my understanding is that this was partly you. You know what? It really, he did a great job of blending about 10 different people together. Yeah, there yeah. were about 10 of us. That specific role is actually, I don't want to give too much away here. I guess I don't yeah. know what he wants me to share. But that is one <laughs> guy that I actually brought over for that particular role. But it's not really him. There's yeah. other, and I believe the name is Mike, right? I forget must, you know, it's, so, I know there's like several different characters. So Mike is another person who mm. is a younger Bowden alum who came over before me. Right. So mm -hmm. he's blended names with stories. I am dog whistled in there, um, in actually a very, uh, unorthodox ways. I'm actually, yeah. I'm dog whistled in the acknowledgements actually. Okay. And I'm dog whistled in some of the events that occurred because I was there, but yeah. he's literally blended to it's, very well put together in that it's, yes. it's actually 10 different people. So one thing has happened, but really this happened in this particular sequence with this person and that person was doing things simultaneously. Well, you know, and, and to refresh the memory of my listeners, or for those of you who are listening for the first time and don't know what we're talking about, this is The Accidental Business Nomad. It's a fantastic book by Kyle Hegarty, who is also based in Singapore. And um, look, the book is really about how to communicate well across cultures, how to lead across cultures, but focused in Singapore and Asia and, and it's told through a series of vignettes and stories and a lot of barroom talk. And it's really, it's just a great way to gain an understanding of the kind of tools that you need to survive as an expat or not just survive, I mean that you need to thrive and lead and be a good manager and be a good employee and maybe start your own business, all those kinds of great things. If you're going to do that in Asia, 
fantastic book. And um, he goes through these lessons he learned about the mistakes that he made and, and the way that he grew as a leader. And part of that story is when he had the um, insight to say, you know what? I can't find the right people I need here. I'm just going to start an intern program and bring people over from Bowdoin. And I'm oversimplifying the whole process. But so he brought interns over from Bowdoin. And, and of course, William is one of those interns that he brought over. And, you know, it was a great way to solve an important problem that he had, which is that culturally, it was very difficult for the culture of Singapore to kind of switch into this an aggressive sales role where you had very aggressive targets and the kind of sales that you guys were doing. In the long run, though, it didn't really work, right? In the long run, he had to change his business model because ultimately you do have to, if you're going to survive and you're going to thrive locally, you have to hire locals, right? Now, yes. you are part of that whole process. I am um, the number two. I'm the you're continuation the of that story. So, and that's, so that's what I wanted to get, get to. Is. That's what consig is, right? Or exactly. consig. And that's what I wanted to get to is how did you, first of all, from your perspective, what was the cultural transformation or evolution like for you coming from Bowdoin and coming to Singapore? And then how does that, how did you take those learnings and apply it to your post Kyle career? Because you didn't just start consig, you had no. stuff in between. Yeah. So, so let's get there. It, it, it actually adds up. So when I was working with Kyle, I was a cold caller. I was doing mm -hmm. lead generation sales, right? And I would call 120 dials a day, uh, be constantly on, on calls with NASA and random mom and pop shops or technology companies, big, small, medium, wherever. Mm -hmm. And we were always so frustrated because we would have to throw these leads after I, I would just, I just wanted to close the deal. Right. But I yeah. would have to sit there and qualify it to a point and then throw it to this big company. And then they wouldn't follow up on it for another nine months. And it was just such a frustrating moment. I was like, you just mm -hmm. have to qualify. You, you can't close it. I'm like, but they're at the close. They're ready to buy. We have to just send it over. So I was doing this, um, not just as an intern, but I became a full-time employee under his group here in Singapore. So I was on, on a paid salary. And I remember having that frustration where I was getting so good at lead generation and qualifying these leads, but then I just would never know what would happen to them. And that right. was his business model, right? And I said, Kyle, can we just close these deals for these businesses, please? He said, that's not in the contract and that's all we do. And that's very risky to close deals on behalf of another company. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of gets the concept for a minute, right? You kind of see mm -hmm. how the story goes. And yeah. here, here I am, this guy, just this young like bull, like I need to do this, right? Uh, yep. I want to close. So I worked under him and I learned so much, I mean, from how to sell, how to command conversations, um, certain just demeanors and, and swaggers. But then he was right. I didn't quite know how to close at scale. I didn't have that, that experience. So I got a phone call one day from um, a French guy and I uh, picked up the phone and he said, you know, hello, uh, we're interested in interviewing you. I'm from Google. I was like, what? Where? Google. I was like, what? Google. I was like, Google? What? Oh my God. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure, okay. buddy. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, want, you want me to interview uh, what? Uh, Thursday? Um, oh, you want yeah, to go to sure. Google office? Sure. Yeah, right. Okay. So I didn't really believe it. I wasn't taking this seriously. I was laughing the whole, the whole time. Turns out I was really it was Google. Google and it was Google mm -hmm. and I ended up doing uh, a bunch of interviews and I ended up getting a role there on the sales team. And it was funny because when I got an offer, I came to Kyle and I said, Kyle, man, look, you brought me out here to Singapore. Um, I got something to tell you. And uh, I think I'm going to have to leave. And we were actually sitting in AXA Tower in Singapore at the time. And the Google office is actually on floor 30 yeah. in that same building. So we're having a beer. And I said, hey, uh, I think I'm going to have to leave. He goes, OK, where are you going? And I said, Actually, I'm going upstairs. And he said, you're going to Red Hat? And I was like, a few levels above Red Hat? It's like probably four floors above Red Hat? And he did the math. You see him looking in the sky. He goes, well, you're going to Google? I was like, yeah. He goes, uh, yeah, take that, dude. Are you serious? Like, so, immediately, so immediately he goes, yeah, uh, when are you starting? When are you starting? So um, I get it. I, I join. I'm on the sales team. But always that time with him was so impactful for me because I learned so much in terms of just sales, cold calling that I was 
very, um, I was far more aggressive in terms of, not aggressive on the phone, but just in terms yeah. of my activity as a salesperson when I was at Google, then I ended up doing that for three years. And for one year, I actually got promoted to a head of knowledge role for a particular department for small accounts. And my job was to create small sales teams and work with that department to create small sales teams across mm -hmm. the world. So there's only three heads of knowledge. And that's where the cross-cultural piece comes in because I was now flying around to India. I was flying to Thailand all the time, Vietnam, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. I was setting the team in, in, in Tokyo office, I was setting the team with China, and I was working in Europe, I would be in Latin America. So I was all around the world setting up these small sales teams. And I noticed that they didn't have the type of experience that I had under Kyle, which was that cold calling, that actual cold conversation, cold approach. And I had to actually develop systems and programs to be able to train these small teams, mm -hmm. which kind of, and this, these were sales teams, not lead generation teams. Well, let, let me ask you just for a point of clarification. When you're talking about creating a small sales team for Google, what is it that Google needs to do cold calling for? You know, You'd be what, surprised. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, it, it, that's why I think most yeah. people don't really know the breadth of their operations and what they do. So like, what was it yeah. that you guys were focused on? Well, this is kind of like Google billboard. Um, so we actually <laughs> saw um, primarily advertising, um, sure. but also um, things from apps to different partnerships, large scale partnerships. Um, everybody knows Google Docs and Google Drive nowadays, but this is actually before that was really Got it. a label. So, you know, talking to, let's say the ministry, Development Economic Board of, of Malaysia, for instance, to be able to, right. get them to fully sign on to a major advertising package for all their uh, local businesses and small, medium sized uh, technology companies under their umbrellas, also using cloud based um, applications and things like that. So, this was the early stage of that and trying to get those relationships going. So there was a lot of cold calling, also a lot of field works. So we were hybrid sellers, so we'd be on the phones, but also on planes just as fast. Sure. But uh, the primary source was advertising. That was the, the, mm -hmm. the main thing that we we're looking at. Um, so all those banners and pre-rolls that you see on YouTube, you can kind of. Sure. Me, unfortunately. Well, of course, you know, and <laughs> well, you know, and we, we all got to make a living. But no, I'm just, <laughs> the uh, it, this was also um, 10 years ago to five years ago. So like it was things changed so rapidly and quickly. You know, now the Google product offering, as you, you even mentioned with uh their app suites with G Suite and with all of the um, different products, how they've been rolled together. And it's different. I'm sure they're selling in different ways now, but it's really fascinating because you had, you said that that's where the, the cross cultural part kicked in. I, I wonder about that because you had been living in Singapore, but you've been living in China before that. And then you've been back to the States and living in Singapore, working under Kyle. Of course, Kyle's book is, is all about that cross-cultural experience. And Raymond, of course, is a cross-cultural trainer um, and sales trainer and all that good stuff. But where you were basically in a role where you, you had to maintain the Western approach, right, to right. work, but in the middle of Singapore, like, but in the middle of Asia. So you were like, you had to maintain this particular way of doing things when the people around you, maybe not in your immediate workplace, but the culture around you was quite different. Like the reason that Kyle brought right. in interns was because doing 120 cold calls a day was something, according to his book anyway, 120 cold calls a day, it was, was not something you're going to necessarily get from most Singaporean college graduates. So how did you cope with, did you, well, first of all, did you run into any kind of, I wouldn't want to say conflicts, but was there a dichotomy of some kind? Was there some sort of stress or tension around you that came from being essentially a Westerner in the middle of a non-Western culture? That's a really good question. Um, so I'll answer that kind of with a quote. A smart person learns from their own challenges. A wise person learns from the challenges of others. I had a cheat sheet. So when I kind of entered <laughs> into that role, I already had people like Raymond and Kyle in my corner, um, effectively telling me, hey, um, so look, here's how we try to go across culture. Here's how you can handle India or Japan or, mm. and I got to hear these stories of that, those cross-cultural challenges and being able to relate and being able to even kind of get past the language barrier or, or sure. understanding buying cycles. These are all very important things that you have to learn by making a lot of mistakes, by things not going well. And yeah. 
that allows you to be able to navigate them differently. I think there were a few advantages I had. One, I still had that contact. I still had those telephone numbers <laughs> to call whenever I had these issues. I mean, for instance, um, in the Philippines, I learned so much about cultural differences in terms of how teams are structured. You know, you can't relieve the duties of, let's say, the manager of a team because the entire team might walk out. Or you can't right. just reward one person with a bonus. They will buy pizzas for everybody. So it's very mm-hmm. collective-based teams there. India will be yeah. a little different in terms of dealing with the local market there and, and how you would do sales in that market, buying patterns in, in Malaysia. And these are all things that, one, I learned in my own sales experience and doing my calls and doing field sales across the region as a salesperson for multiple years in Google, but then, and also under Kyle, but then also having that kind of old knowledge, old hand knowledge as well to say, look, on a higher level, this is what everything you've experienced really means. That allowed me to have a bit of a cheat sheet. Um, Have I experienced uh, instances? Of course, every day, even in ConSig right now. But um, that is, I mean, we have nine offices around the world, multiple time zones. The sun actually doesn't set on our org. That's very complicated to do because you're dealing, I have people in Nairobi, I have people in Budapest, I have people in the UK, I have Americans, I have French people, I have South Africans, I have Thais, mm-hmm. Vietnamese, Malaysians, Indonesians, you know, uh, Filipinos, Indians. So I, I, Chinese people, like we, and we all operate under one banner, one label, and we speak kind of the same language in terms of mm-hmm. what we're trying to achieve. And that, that a lot of that's based on making a lot of mistakes cross culturally yeah. before and just understanding, ah, this is this is how you're able to connect the dots with people. It's just really understanding the complexities of each culture. To get to that point, I mean, you know, it does take a long time, I think, certainly. And you I think that was really a very important point is that you shouldn't think that you have to do it alone, learning from learn from the mistakes of others is probably the wrong way to say it, but like a wise person learns from the challenges of others, you know, having people in your corner is a recipe, one of the recipes I think for success, one of the, I think tools in the toolkit that you should certainly always have. And you seem to have done fairly well with it, but let's take it from Google. You were running sales for small businesses at Google or small teams. Sorry, you were creating small sales teams for Google and in different areas Why did you ultimately leave, you know, without getting too into it, I suppose, because Google is Google and they're definitely listening to this. I hope (laughs) they are. (laughs) I had a great time at Google. I'm sure they are. Yeah. Like, how how did you, yeah, I was just going to say, how did you get from there to consig and take us along that journey? Well, Google was my advanced degree. I see it was not sales school. Sales school was under Kyle. I don't think, I mean, you know, no offense to Google, but just the sales structure, the sales processes had a lot of gaps in it which is the reason why they were trying to figure yeah. it out. They're trying to find ways to penetrate into the market. They make a lot of the same mistakes and they face a lot of the same challenges that small businesses do. But as I was building out these teams, I was realizing that connection between the frustration I was having being a lead generator under Kyle and then seeing teams that I was building close out large bill sizes and develop pipelines to where they're able to close business. And I actually was connecting the dots. And I said, you know, this is the answer. This is how you do it. This was something that I learned in Google in terms of how to set up a team, that you can have a Mm -hmm. team of, let's say, 10 in Japan. They can cover all of that region. You know, uh, you can have a team of five here. You can have a team of 20 here. And just where to kind of place people in terms of headcount, what are the skill sets you need, how do you break down the sales process. And I developed my own little money ball or my own little kind of cocktail of how I would want a sales department to run. And Mm -hmm. I always told myself, look, I think as a salesperson, as a former sales rep, I would love a full department just to handle my emails. I would love a full department just to handle my social LinkedIn outreach. I would want a full department just to handle my calls. I would want a full department just to do the face-to-face. And that's how Consig is structured. So there is no one sales rep that's everything. We're broken down into different departments that handle different parts of the sales process. And that's from my own kind of learnings of setting up teams. And it's also based on military. If you notice, you have platoons, you have a communications guy, you have a medic, Mm -hmm. you have a sniper, you have a gunner, you have a scout. Very same thing from a sales perspective. It's very systems thinking, isn't it? I mean, you have, you know, you have all the elements of system and one of those, if if one of those elements breaks, you can quickly replace it with with another element. I mean, it's a beautiful way to think about it. 
Exactly. And that's how the culture issue actually gets removed. When you turn it into a sales system and not relying on a sales, one salesperson to be alone to go out there and do your bidding, which 99.9% of all companies do. They hire one salesperson to do their bidding. Well, mm-hmm. now you're relying on that person's culture, temperament, personality, that one person's. But if that person's part of a system where they're given that support and they're never alone. You're never walking into a cell alone. You have support. You have someone shadowing, taking notes quietly. You have somebody drafting the follow-up email. You have someone giving you the notes on the company. You have the full profile, mm-hmm. full tactical move on a cell. You now are not a lone salesperson. You're just the voice who's so, trying to close the deal. So this sales system, this group of functions put together to fulfill the entire sales process beginning end to end is what consig does essentially right exactly so and, we call ourselves but, a sales mercenary group for a reason right and you do that for your client companies will hire you guys to be the sales mercenaries for their company and exactly end. so okay. we deal with large mnc's smes and we were starting with startups but then we realized startups actually couldn't afford us because they're startups. <laughs> so we ended up quickly going into SMEs, MNCs, and also governments. We work with EDBs and things like that to be that floating sales department, that on-demand global sales force. We, we're used to do go-to-market strategies for businesses anywhere we can generate revenue. So we either go to market, into new markets, or we help them in their local market, or we even compete with their internal sales teams to keep their internal teams at a certain bar so that no one's hiding. Sure. And these are things that you know came about through that Google experience where I realized, wow, there, there's a lot of gaps in the sales department here. It's good, but you know, hey, at the end of the day, there are ways that we could operate probably a little bit more efficiently. We could, you know, probably support the sales rep. And companies do a bad job, and do not just Google, but companies do a terrible job of really supporting the sales rep. Most of the time, they just give you a target, they give mm-hmm. you the product, they give you a little bit of training here, and then they say, okay, now go give us a million dollars, right? And well, it's more complex than that. Well, is that where marketing comes in? I mean, to a degree, I mean, how do you interact with corporate marketing teams or do you also do some of that yourself? The epic snowball fight, right? Uh, marketing yeah. and sales. Marketing says you're not, you know, uh-huh. capitalizing on what we're giving you. And then sales says you're not giving us enough. Um, we actually have, we're, we're partnered with a performance marketing team and actually the, um, the CEO of that company is the CMO of Consig for anything that involves marketing. Um, we are primarily a sales force. But um, we often work with our companies. The, the ideal client is one that has an effective marketing team, but mm-hmm. we do provide marketing services as well, just depending on the stage of the business. But that's, that all comes from that, that Google experience. And actually, to, to your question, leaving Google was actually me saying, hmm, you know, I've been here for now four plus years. I want to try something new. I think that going into the startup space was just appetizing at that time. So I said, okay, let me leave. And I ended up working at uh, Trey Gecko, which just got acquired by QuickBooks a few months ago. And I was um, director of sales for Trey Gecko for a year. And when I got into that, which was a startup at the time, they had the same exact gaps that Google did. Hmm. Same exact gaps. There was nothing different. You have a $60 billion a year company, and then here you have a startup. Same problems, same questions, same challenges, same confusion, same scattered management, same lack of understanding of what a salesperson really is and what you need to build a sales team. So that was very enlightening for me because I was able to see, oh, this is just a problem. Everybody's having cross-cultural challenges in sales. Everybody's having structural and process challenges in sales. It's not just big or small companies. It's a general thing. And it's not limited to sales, by the way, William. I mean, you probably know this better than most from dealing with, you know, when, when you're essentially an agency and you're, and you're dealing with multiple clients, you probably see the problems that they all have um, in different ways. I mean, how many, I don't know if you're at liberty to say, but how many customers, well, you have so many markets, but let's say in a, in a given market, how many customers do your teams typically service? So is, is year, that a number you can say? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so we have some clients that have been with us for three plus years. We do an mm-hmm. intake of 20 clients a year. Oh, okay. So you juggle multiple clients. My, my point was just to get to the fact that you deal with multiple companies with multiple of multiple shapes and sizes. And you're saying that they are basically all have this singular problem that you are there to solve, um, which is, you know, that there's these gaps in the sales process and the sales teams. And guess what? You can parachute in, consig, and they will just 
handle it. Pretty much. Now, what fascinates me about that is that it seems to be that this is an issue across all functions at companies. Like, I mean, clearly there are businesses that are there to take over the accounting function for bigger businesses because there are gaps in the accounting team. There are businesses that take care of the marketing because there's gaps in the marketing team. I was just speaking today with a colleague of mine. You know, we were talking about basically our journey and how we have, you know, the kind of accomplishments that we've done inside communications for our company. And, and looking at some of the competitors in the marketplace and looking at other companies, it's like they all have the same, well, it's, they all is wrong. That's sorry. But many have the same problem, the same challenge. And we'd like to think that we are putting our company at a major advantage because we're solving this problem for them while some of their competitors are still languishing without a modern communications team, you know? And um, it just amazes me that so many corporations just don't get it. Like, why wouldn't, I know this is not a question that necessarily we can answer, but why wouldn't companies just get wise and say, these are the three or four sales models that work. We should be doing this. This is the communications model that works. We should be doing this. You know, like it would make sense, yeah. but yet they stick to old habits and bad habits and difficult to change. Well, well yes, there's so much archaic stuff passed down and it's, it's much easier. I mean, a lot of it is due to management. Very few sales managers have actually done a cold call in their life. And very few CEOs have ever had any sales experience. I think it was something like 9% of all CEOs have ever held sales role ever to date. Hmm. That's literally documented by Cary Institute, right? Like that is an actual stat that 91% of CEOs have never done sales in their life. So how would that's they know surprising to me. What, how would they know what good sales means? Mm -hmm. But um, to your point about other departments as well doing similar stuff, people are comfortable outsourcing their marketing. People are comfortable sure. outsourcing their development. People are comfortable outsourcing their PR. People are comfortable outsourcing their HR. When you get to sales, suddenly the conversation changes and people get extremely uncomfortable. And we're often confused with like a BPO or a lead generation company, and we're not. We actually have a world-class lead generation organization within Consig in order to do sales. But um, we, we are one of the only companies that I know that actually do end-to-end -end sales. And we've done extensive research globally to try to find somebody who fits our exact model. But most people say, yeah, we do end-to-end -end sales. They say they're a sales organization or on-demand sales, but really they are just doing marketing and kind of outreach and then capturing it. Yeah. Leads. But no one's really sure. doing the full kind of thing, even down to billing and bill of sale and operating anonymously because we, we operate anonymously under the identity of our clients. Of course. Very few groups are doing that because honestly, it's a very difficult space to tell someone you are going to be responsible for their revenue. You're Everything. putting a lot on the line. I mean, you're putting yeah. a lot on the line. Everything. You're saying to your clients that you will learn their business. You will learn their products. You'll be able to sell their products better than their own people can sell their products in many cases. Otherwise, why would they hire you? So, yeah. you know, how could you, you know, these, I'm sure some of the companies, especially in Asia, they have been, they've been working on these things, on these products for a hundred years. Why would we bring in an external team, you know? And uh, that's a high hurdle. And you definitely take on some risk when you, when you make that deal, but you're doing it. We started four years ago every day. And I was on a call uh, this morning um, with a company in Egypt, very large company in Egypt. Um, same question what makes you think you guys can do this better than <laughs> anybody that we hire? And, you know, it's based on the systems that I described. It's based on experience. And it's really based on aligning yourself with, with KPIs, which when you hire somebody mm -hmm. internally, you know, they have holiday, they have coffee breaks, they have sick days, they have smoke breaks. I mean, all these things are there. When you're telling your client, look, a company is responsible now for your revenue, not an individual. That actually yeah. is a differentiator. So even though, yes, it's a big risk, it's a big, bold move, but it would be a bold move if I was one person. We're over sure. 120 people and we have departments that specifically tailor to the analysis, the reports. And, and the, so the systems make that risk feel less risky because yeah. you have just so many people willing to take up the areas that might be concerning. So we've set it up in a way to where we've been very effective and we've gone non-funded. We're not a funded organization. Um, That's amazing. I started it with my dogs in the other room. My dog was there. I was on a sofa and I said, I'm going to start my own sales mercenary group. I was reading Eric Prince's Civilian Warriors about Blackwater. And I said, hmm, I could do that in sales. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's and, what and, and that's how we set it up. You know, it was literally done with probably, you know, uh, $15. 
<laughs> Good for you, man. I mean, you know, I was, this is not the first conversation I've had about systems and the importance of the operations, the processes being the central kind of value that you provide in some ways. I was going to say, this isn't the first conversation I've had about this. It's not the first conversation I had about it even today, because I was on, I was talking to somebody earlier on a very different topic, but we were talking about business building and um, he brought up the E-Myth. Have you ever read the E-Myth? It's this one. I've heard of it actually. I've, right? I've heard of it. Yeah. The, the E-Myth, the entrepreneur myth. And it's a classic, you know, it's like from the eighties or something, but I mean, it's been revised Michael Gerber. And one of his findings, the things that he tries to kind of get across to any potential entrepreneur or small business owner is you have to work on the business, not in the business. And if you are okay. working in the business, then you're just a technician. Go do that for somebody else. Really what you want to do is be able to walk away from it and let it operate. But the way you do that is by building the systems that make it happen. He points to franchise models as the thing to look at. Like not to be a franchisee, he's not saying go get a franchise, but he's saying the reason that the most successful businesses are franchises is because they define a process and every little thing, re remove all choice, remove all room for error, most room for error, and give anybody this, a system, a blueprint to follow. And that's the way you should build your own business. Now, I don't know if that's always true. It's just his, that's the way he approaches it. But it seems to me that consig is kind of like that in some ways. You've built a system. It's a I'm sure it's manualized. I'm sure you have it down so that you can then recreate it in any market, anywhere, with whatever adjustments be, need to be made for the culture or for the language, and it's done. Yep, everything is local. So it seems brilliant to me. I'm well, giving. I'm, I mean, I'm just. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. Well, like a prime example of systems and the advantage of working in teams. For instance, let's say if one of our sales reps is on a call. Well, we have our researchers also shadowing that call and saving that call. And simultaneously, while that conversation is happening, that analyst is sitting there developing the proposal. So people are mm -hmm. amazed at the speed. So we're able to produce proposals probably by the end of the call because we've developed all the different pain points and KPIs and we're able to fire off a proposal, set up meetings, do follow up. So the system is so it's almost too quick to where sometimes we need to actually delay things. So people don't realize like, wow, did they just give us a template? It's like, no, actually this is customized for you. You just had five people listening to you right now. And they were handling different parts of this proposal simultaneously while the sales rep is talking to you. So that sales Jeez. rep can just focus on being a closer while everybody around is now doing all the data, doing the cross analysis, doing the research on the different markets that they're covering. And then at the end of the call, here you go, here's your proposal, let's go. You know, and that's how we set it up. Well, it is no surprise that you're doing well with this business, William. I mean, it seems you've identified those gaps for sure. You've connected quite a few dots. And I know that, you know, I've worked with quite a few companies where, and I'm on the marketing side. So that sales and marketing kind of tete-a-tete -tete that happens sometimes, I've been right in the thick of it. But I will say that there's plenty of organizations now where they've moved much more toward a marketing model, you know, sales and marketing mixed where, you know, you understand the difference between inbound and outbound and you know when you get leads and when they're marketing qualified and when to hand them off and all these kind of good things that really automation has made much more possible than ever before. And, you know, it does vary B2B, B2C. There's different kinds of processes that, and the processes are probably the same. It's just more about the speed at which each interaction takes place and the frequency and um, the kinds of things that you need to stress at each point and the way you're targeting your audience. But it's fascinating to me, man. I, I haven't had the opportunity. I, look, I want to thank you because I haven't had much of an opportunity to ponder sales. You know, one thing I love about my podcast and I love a lot of things about my podcast. But one thing, I, one thing I really like is when I meet people and have people on my on my show who teach me things and who I'm able to learn from. And I was able to actually. Now my brain is going. I mean, I, I there's a lot more I want to kind of dig into here with what you're doing with Consig, and I'm going to be following you. But sadly, and this happens a lot. In fact, every time we come to the end of our program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got to wrap us up, but, um, but we had a lot to cover. I think that I want to have you on again, William, so that we can have a deeper chat about other things. But before we go, if people want to find out more about William Gilchrist, you can check out LinkedIn, um, look up William Gilchrist. His name will be spelled as it is on the title of this episode. And you can check out consig, which is K-O-N-S-Y-G dot com. Correct. 
right. KONSYG.com. And um, feel free to email me as well, william.g at KONSYG.com. And uh, there you have it. I mean, William Gilchrist, incredible individual, you know, and there's other stories here. This, I mean, I, I can't sing William's praises high enough because, I mean, we've been talking for a couple of weeks now, but there's this whole story about how Will, I'm going to just leave this as a tantalizing piece for part two, because there's this whole story about how Will decided to go out and become an entrepreneur and basically got himself down to this penniless condition, walking across a bridge with nothing but a sandal. Am I getting that right? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> I remember it too. That's going to be a great one. <laughs> I love that. So we'll get into the storytelling of Will Gilchrist the next time, but William, thank you so much for being on today. Thanks for having me. I'm really, really happy to be here. It was a great chat. If you enjoyed this episode of The Dan Nessel Show, please head on over to iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or the podcast player of your choice to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. And please don't forget to spread the word. Thanks for listening.